cheers and welcome back to espresso espresso and kabbalah chapter 22 we are on the final section of chapter 22 and um it's super fascinating today we're going to take a deep dive into the anatomy of the ego the soul the godly soul the animal soul and how we can resist the darkness and the negativity and actually take it and use it to help us get to greater heights. So l'chaim, cheers to everybody. I hope you're having a wonderful, successful week and a happy Thursday. Nothing like espresso and Kabbalah. <laughs> so good. So Section three, we're on page 251. The negative forces resist and deny God. What does this mean? We studied last week how the negative forces in this world, the evil, they don't get their energy and life force from God face forward, gifting it to them, like with a big hug. No, it's very behind the shoulder. It's coming from I don't really want to be giving you for life force and positivity and vivification, but I'm doing it because we need evil in this world to give us the free choice, to give us the chance to go between right and wrong. Now that Tanya will explain that not only do these negative forces differ in their source of energy, meaning behind as opposed to face to face in like a, I'm just going to beam my countenance upon you and give you life. Actually, it's also different in the way that they receive godly energy. We're rolling right into it in the Hebrew text on page 251, chapter 22 of the Tanya. Vihine, Ratzon Ha'alyan, now God's will, his face, Bechinas Panim, who Mekar Hachayim Hamachaya Es Kol Ha'alamais. So God's will is the source of all life and it energizes all the worlds. But there's a difference here. <clears throat> Cheers, everybody. <laughs> How's your espresso? Amazing. <laughs> so good. So, Ulafisha and Ashara Kalal al Sitra since the energy of God's face doesn't rest on the Sitra Acha, remember, he's not giving the evil the face to face energy, he's giving it over the shoulder back energy. Page 252, Even the behind of God's will, it doesn't actually become enmeshed in the Sitra Achra. So it's kind of saying something interesting here that even though evil and negativity has godly energy giving it life and sustenance, it's actually not really. <clears throat> It doesn't really have God's energy like absorbed in it. It's like um, surrounding it and encircling it from above. It's like a, the Sitra Akra, it says in the Tanya, is a zone of death and impurity. May God protect us. It doesn't have godly light shining within it. It's just like, imagine like a, an IV drip of godly light is in every single thing in our planet. Every water bottle, every iPhone, anything that we have in our world has godly sparks giving it existence. Now the evil, the negativity, it doesn't even have godly sparks in it. It's just kind of encircled with this godly light. <clears throat> so that behind energy, it's, it's just like... It's not really getting actual life. It's kind of getting like anti, like kind of um, trapped off form of life. So if it doesn't absorb life energy, how can the evil exist? Why is it existing? Kimeat nizer, and this is leading to something very interesting. So hold on tight. Kimeat nizer ar v'chayes sheyanekas umekabelas asaycha mevchinas achorayim dekedusha shelamayla, because the tiny glimmer of light. And minuscule amount of life energy that the Sitra Achra does suck from, like the behind energy of God's holiness and receive inwardly. It remains totally exiled within the Sitra Achra. So imagine 
we have an IV drip going into evil in this world and it's like here's a little drop of godly life of godly energy now you can exist but that tiny little minuscule amount is like trapped within it so it's it, it has life but like hardly and it's so in jail within this thing so imagine something negative in the world something bad it leads people to do bad things right it's it's negative how is it existing how is it alive how does it have the power to continue because godly energy is being dripped into it in a very, very minimal and exiled and unconscious way. And this is the secret of the Shekhinah's exile, beside Gala Sashkina Hanis El. So therefore, we can understand why the evil and negativity is called other gods. We don't believe in other gods. What other gods are we suddenly talking about? It's actually other gods because it's kind of considered idolatrous. Shehuava Dazara Mamish. It's it's really serving idols when we think that something evil exists on its own away from godliness. It denies the non duality of God, the King of Kings, the Blessed Holy One. So the evil, the impurity, it resists God's life energy. Even if it has a teeny teeny drop of energy that it's absorbing, it's in exile, it's trapped within it, and it's unrecognized by the Sitra Akhra as the power of God. This is idolatry, the denial of God. So imagine somebody walking around saying, I created myself, God didn't create me, there's no such thing as God, and I'm going to deny that anything created me but myself. So that little life force that God is sustaining him with is in exile, and it's subconscious, and it's not recognized by him. Section four, the psychology of idolatry. So cheers. How is it possible? Why does the Sitra Akhra deny God? As mentioned earlier, how can somebody reject God? The source of God rejection comes from the ego and an unwillingness to surrender the self. So the ego gets a pretty bad rap most of the time when we look in spiritual texts because they're like, surrender yourself, nullify yourself, don't have an ego, just be focused on giving yourself over to God, to others, whatever. And the Tanya is actually here to say something a little bit different. <clears throat> the Tanya is here to explain to us that yes, we have an ego. Yes, we have a part of us that is denying Hashem, right? It's saying, I'm just here to serve myself. We're not here to throw the ego under the bus and say, forget about you, I'm not looking at you, I'm just going to turn myself into an angel and never have a human thought or feeling again. Actually, think about it this way. We need the ego to have Jewish pride, Ge'on Yaakov, to have a backbone, to feel good about ourselves, to be proud of who we are and what we can accomplish and our mission in this world, to have a purpose. We need it to accomplish amazing things. But who is sitting in the driver's seat? Is it our ego, our selfish desires? Are those driving us? Are those the life force that's taking us along for the ride? When we get into an argument, is it our ego in charge saying, prove me right, you know, I'm going to win this, this is a battle that I'm going to be, you know, victorious in, or is it the godly soul that is driving the ego, <clears throat> the ego, excuse me. If the godly soul is in charge and saying, let's serve Hashem, let's make this world a better place. Now, let's turn around and harness this powerful ego, this powerful backbone and sense of self and identity and pride, Jewish pride, pride in who we are, and let's bring it along for the ride to make this world a beautiful and godly place. So if you're going to walk along on the street and try to get something positive done, if you're just walking without a car, it might take you a lot longer. <laughs> Sometimes a car is really helpful. And that's like the godly soul has really good intentions, but sometimes it's just walking and it doesn't have so much going for it, right? We don't give it so much energy or attention. But imagine that godly soul is harnessed to this Ferrari or stallion or whatever horsepower you picture. 
of a lot of energy and a lot of force, that can go so fast, so far, and do so much good. So the Tanya comes to teach us in chapter 22. Yes, there's evil in this world. Yes, there's so much selfishness and destruction, and it's not good. But what can we do with it? We can harness it for the good. We can bring it along for the ride, and we can use the ego to accomplish amazing things. And if we can think of an example of this, it's like, if I don't feel good about myself, if I'm not proud of who I am, if I'm not proud to be a Jew, if I'm not proud of my purpose and my mission, I'm not going to be able to do what the godly soul wants me to do. I'm not going to be able to make Hashem happy and bring godliness into this world. It's only when I harness my inner sense of pride and strength that I can do something amazing with it. So if somebody is a really proud Jew and they've harnessed their inner will, they can maybe invite a bunch of friends for a Shabbat meal, maybe they can host a Farbrengan, you can invite a bunch of your friends over and have a night of sharing good times and l'chaims and good wishes. So we need to harness whatever we're passionate about, whatever the ego, we're all different, right? We all have different things that excite us, that we get, you know, we have different values. What's number one for me might be number three for you and vice versa, like we're not all the same. But let's take what excites us and is like gives us passion in this world and devote it to Hashem. And therefore, the godly soul will be driving and using the ego as horsepower. So now we're going to explain that a little bit inside the text. So thanks for tuning in to <laughs> Espresso and Kabbalah. Um, page 253. We'll read a little bit of the Hebrew. Right, this is about the holy light. It's unconscious within the evil. It's not surrendered to God's holiness. The Adraba, on the contrary, Magbia Atzma Kanesher. What does the ego do? This is such a beautiful quote. Rather than humbling and surrendering itself to God, the Sitra Achra inflates its ego, making itself as high as an eagle. Laimar Ani Va'afsi Aid, saying, There's me and there's no one else but me. From Isaiah. Ukmaimar Ya'arli Va'ani Asisani. Asisini. As in Pharaoh's egotistical statement, The river is mine and I have made myself. So we all know Pharaoh um, in Egypt, he went into the Nile River and said, um, I created the Nile River. I created myself. I am a completely self-made human. That's why our sages of blessed memory said that an inflated ego is equivalent to actual idolatry. Non-surrender hardens your ego, giving you a strong sense of separateness, which is a denial of God's presence within you and every other existing thing. So why is egoism like idolatry? What is idolatry? What is that perception which leads to this inflated sense of ego? What is ego in a negative sense? It's a perception of being a separate being, independent entity, separate from God, separate from anything else sacred, just me, myself, and I by myself. And this is a conviction that God exists, but that we're separate from him. So we can't deny God. We can't say that we're separate from him. It's not a complete denial, right? There are different levels in egoism. Um, they refer to him, him as the God of gods. So some people say God exists, but he doesn't really um, work with us anymore. He kind of left the building. We're on page 254, the last few lines of chapter 22 of the Tanya. Even though these individuals don't deny God completely, they perceive themselves as autonomous entities and independent beings. So these are the moments where we say, 
thank you very much, God. You've done a lot of good things for me. I have a lot of blessings in my life, but um, I'm, I'm good now. I, I don't need your help. I'm on my own. And in this way, someone can separate themselves from God's holiness since their sense of utter independence causes them not to surrender themselves to him. So when we think where everything is my power, my strength, I'm wealthy, I'm successful, famous, powerful, whatever people's goals are, it's all because of me. I put in the sweat, I got up early in the morning, I did everything that I could to make this happen. It's not really Hashem. Like, thank you God for creating the world and everything like that, but I did this. It's not you, it's me. So that sense of independence causes someone to say, I don't really need to surrender myself to you, right? Because I'm fine without you. I'm good on my own. Now that sense of I'm good on my own is a very healthy thing to have. We should have a strong backbone and a sense of self, but not to take us away and let that be the driving force in our lives, right? Just me by myself, I don't care about anybody else alone. We're actually meant to say, I have a beautiful, powerful being and the driving force is the godly soul, which says, well, let's take this beautiful, holy, powerful being and use it to serve Hashem. So why is it idol worship to be egotistical? What happens when someone serves an idol, when they bend their knees and they bow down to a stone, a rock, a tree? They turn away and they worship other gods. What does turning away mean? We turn our attention away from attaching to the Blessed Holy One and we worship other gods. It's as if we've become idolaters. We're on the last line. As we mentioned above, supernal holiness only rests on something which is surrendered to Him. If you think about any relationship without surrender and vulnerability and trust, how can we unite? How can we be two separate people who become whole and become one? So, therefore, God says, if we can surrender to each other, we can have holiness, we can have a relationship, we can be one. The negative forces are called in the Zohar divided mountain peaks. Their perception is everything is separate and divided, fragmented, each man for himself, we're all wild animals in a jungle, and we're all just alone fighting for doggy dog world and everything. It, it becomes very destructive when people feel like separateness and fragmentation and holiness is when we realize that we need each other and we need to come together and bring our unique and beautiful selves to complete this puzzle because we're all part of one puzzle and every puzzle piece is necessary to make a full picture and Finishing off the chapter, um, Mazel Tov, we are completing chapter 22 of the Tanya. This non-surrendered self-image is a denial of God's real non-duality. So like we said a few weeks ago, we discussed the concept that there's nothing but Hashem, right? In His presence, everything is considered like zero. And all, all of existence is genuinely voided of any separate entity before God may he be blessed and before his will which sustains all things and brings them into existence constantly something from nothing. So when we surrender and say, Hashem, you're in charge. This world is from you, it's for you, and it's all about you, and we are doing our part to make everything come together and make it a beautiful world. Um, bringing our ego along for the ride, bringing our gifts, our talents, our passions along to do what we can to make this world a better place. And that's why we need everything in this world. Negative forces, bad things, ego, selfishness. It's not for the garbage can. It's not trash. It's actually sustained by God's life energy. And he's not giving it life because he has to. He's giving it life because he wants us to 
use it. You, if you feel arrogant or egotistical, it's okay. Use it to lead you to a path of, I'm a proud person and I'm going to show my Jewish pride or I'm going to use my strengths that I am gifted inside of me to serve Hashem and to pronounce His presence in this world. So I had a teacher who used to say, um, like even if you feel like you have some negative character traits or you're unhappy with your flaws or whatever is bothering you about yourself, instead of exiling them and making them separate from you, use them to do the right thing. So what's an example of that? <clears throat> like being um, stubborn. <laughs> yeah. So what can you use that for, for the good? Just turn it around. Stubbornly resist the evil. Yes, person. exactly. <laughs> Such a good one. <laughs> so if you're like, no, I have a stubborn streak, this is not going to happen, use it to fight the negativity in your life, to fight the negativity in yourself. Use whatever you're given as a tool in your toolbox to make this world amazing. So thank you so much. Next week is chapter 23 How to Connect to God through Mitzvah.